and he's going to be running the program here at Sandy Hook. We actually have another program that's very similar to what's being managed over in New York City. It's managed by Chris Alieri. He actually started the program like two years ago, and he's grown it um, exorbitantly. I think he's got over like probably over 150 active members right now that are out on the beaches of uh, Reese Beach and Fort Tilden. Um, and so the name of that organization is New York City Piping Clover Project. If you want to take a look at it online. Um, we do have a representative here to talk about her experience working over there um, for the New York City Clover Project. And then Dom, who's our photographer, um, Jack Well Trades, he's going to be um, videotaping for those individuals that missed the training today, but um, he's also going to be snapping photos. But he's going to share out about his experience last year. Because last year was the first year we started the program here at Sandy Hook. So um, we're hoping to have a CVA every year so that um, we can continually manage this program. In May, we're going to have three SCAs. They're called Student Conservation Ambassador. Um, Student Conservation Association, all these acronyms. Student Conservation Association interns, um, they are going to be resource interpretation interns helping uh, John as well as all of you guys out in the field. Um, and so we're going to have a great season. Um, it's getting busier and busier and the birds are already here. They came back late February, early March. And so um, hopefully the weather holds out and we'll be able to go out um, you know, there's no guarantees with the birds, but you know, we can only hope and pray and keep our fingers crossed. So, um, welcome to Gateway National Recreation Area. Uh, Gateway is actually a very large park. It's 27,000 acres across two states, New York and New Jersey. The two units that are in New York are the Jamaica Bay unit and the Staten Island unit. And then here at the northern point of uh, Jersey, we have the Sandy Hook unit. Um, and as you can see, all those areas are in green that we uh, protect and preserve. Quite a bit of water that we protect. Areas close to the water as well. Um, and so Gateway was established in 1972, and it provides, we're hoping, the, the, the Gateway experience is going to be that where you're enjoying our natural, cultural, and recreational opportunities in the park. Um, we do, in every park, there, there's usually a theme, or themes plural, and we do have themes plural here at Gateway, and we focus our efforts on maritime heritage, um, and maritime heritage would be the history of this building, which is the U.S. Life Saving Station. Uh, dating back to 1894. If you want to learn more about that, we can get at the end of the, the workshop. But um, so, and the Sandy Hook Lighthouse. So those are examples of maritime heritage and then coastal defense um, history, which you'll find all at the northern end of the park, what we call Fort Hancock. And we also have a number of other forts throughout Gateway. So that's another theme that threads through the park. And then um, it's about protection of our maritime, I'm um, sorry, of our natural resources. Um, we have a plethora of natural resources that we protect and preserve. And again, mostly near um, our coastal borders. And so here at Sandy Hook, we have a very large maritime um, forest, holly forest. We have examples of beach, um, primary dunes, secondary dunes, upland area salt marshes, um, so hopefully all of you get a chance to get out there and experience uh, Sandy Hook a little bit more. Um, and so yeah, and we provide recreational opportunities. So you, there's a mop trail that runs the entire length of the park here. Um, and you know, again, we're trying to focus our efforts on providing opportunities for our visitors to enjoy recreation, natural resources, and cultural resources. So Sandy Hook is, uh, it's about seven miles um, long, and we have a number of beaches here. Some of, most of them on the ocean side are, are lifeguarded, 
And we do have a clothing optional beach at Gunnison. So just don't be surprised if you see nudists at Gunnison. We do allow that. So, um, and you know, sometimes that can get a little bit uncomfortable. And if, you, and if you're not comfortable with that, that's fine. There's plenty other areas and territory to cover here at Sandy Hook. Um, and the beaches that we have lifeguards are at C, D, E, G, which is Gunnison, uh, and North Beach, otherwise known as I. Um, and so North Beach is probably the least visited because it has such a long beach um, to get to. So most people you'll see at what we call our family friendly beaches are at C, D, E, and then um, your more adult version beach would be Gunnison. Um, so now I'm going to switch it over to John. He's going to share out about specifically the Shorebird Ambassador Program. And then I'll see you in a couple of minutes. because I'm gonna... As uh, Jen introduced me, my name is Jonathan All. I think most of you have met me. Uh, we did the string line fencing project. The rest of you work with me. So I think we're all pretty familiar with each other. And I'm just going to speak very briefly about the reason for our project, the piping plover. These are all photos taken from within the park. I think almost all of them by our volunteers. I think Dom took a couple of them. He's very prolific. Uh, I'll let our head of natural resources, Patty, give you the whole breakdown of the piping plover. But just so everyone understands what we're looking for and what we're trying to protect, it's these little guys. They are very small. I believe adults are an average of maybe seven inches tall with a 15 inch wingspan. They generally look like this, but not quite, and they sound like this. <laughs> Hence the name. <laughs> also important to note is the eggs of the piping plover. I don't know how well all of you can see this, but they are about this size. They are small and they are speckled, and they fit very well blending into the sand dunes where the piping plovers make their home. So these are small birds that are very hard to spot and that makes them vulnerable at times because predators can find them and sometimes people can accidentally disturb their areas, which is why we do things like the string line fencing to protect them as best we can. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but Sandy Hook is very important to piping plovers. We typically get about a third of all migrations to New Jersey end up at Sandy Hook. That's because Sandy Hook has pretty ideal nesting conditions for the piping plovers. It gives them the space they need, a large undeveloped area, relatively unfrequented. Obviously, we are a national park. We're a very popular beach. We get thousands of visitors every year to our beaches, but there are plenty of areas in which the birds can find small kind of safe havens. They typically stay in the sort of brushy areas about maybe 160 feet from a beach, and they like to feed in the intertidal zone, which is that kind of rocky area where the high tide comes in. So you may see them in the mid-afternoon sort of doing their little hunt and peck running around. Now, they are not, I don't believe in danger, but they are critically threatened, and that means that their recovery is a federal goal, and that's one of the reasons we have the Piping Clover Project and the Shorebird Ambassador Project. And really this project is focused on two main goals and that is conservation and education. We've already done a lot of the first, which is the string line fencing. Our uh, biotechs here and Patty, again, head of natural resources, do a lot of the work to protect them in nature. And it's our job as the ambassadors to kind of protect them from a lot of the human intrusion. And that means going out on the beaches, talking to people, making sure they're not breaking the rules and explaining why the rules exist. And of course, you may know the rules if you go here. We have them on a bunch of signs, if anybody reads the signs. But of course, some of the biggest issues are litter, you know, especially broken glass, especially medical waste. It can harm them. Uh, bikes are another big problem. They're very big disruptors. A lot of people like to go off the bike trail and ride on the beach with fat tire bikes because it's a better workout, but they end up riding either too close to the string line fencing or they ride right through the intertidal zone. So that's very easy to disrupt their feeding habits. Kites are another one people don't really think about too much, but kites are, well, they're one a hazard if they fall out of the sky 
into the nesting area and to their shadows are perceived by the piping plovers as predatory, so they might abandon the nest if a kite is flying over it. And of course, the biggest one is dogs. We do allow dogs on Oceanside beaches in the winter months, but from March to September, we do not allow them on the ocean side. They're allowed on the Bayside, on the bike trail, at Fort Hancock, so long as they're leashed, but they are not allowed anywhere on the ocean side. It's one of the biggest hazards to wildlife because even if a dog is just like running around on the beach and is nowhere near the piping plovers, it can easily scare them away from the area for days, if not entirely. So it's, it's one of the biggest things we try to catch people in the act doing and explain them why they can't. And so, yes, uh, like I was saying, our shorebird ambassadors primarily, we, we do sometimes work with biotechs, but primarily we're focused on outreach and education and raising awareness. One of the ways we do this is we man education tables. We did that a lot last year. You can see pictures there. We do them at the Beach Plaza, C, and I believe we're doing G Beach, right? Yeah. Okay, so we are doing Gunnison as well. And when you man an education booth, you'll be working with an intern uh, or an intern. Or a smart. Yeah. And we'll be walking you through what a pop-up is. It's like a short, informal, informal program. We might do stuff like uh, teaching people how to recognize bird calls or playing little matching games so they can match uh, baby chicks to adults. Maybe doing a little presentation to show how climate change can affect the piping clovers. Things like that. And we will train you on that when you do the education booths. We also will have people that will just be walking the frequented paths, the bike trails, parts of the beaches, again, looking for rule breakers, answering questions, and just trying to raise awareness about the clovers themselves. It's back to you, Claire. Sure, sure. So just a couple of things that I want wanted everybody uh, to know about as a volunteer. You do have rights, and we hope that we are providing a safe work environment for everyone, and if we're not, please reach out to us and let us know what we can do to make it safer. Um, you're going to be receiving the same fair use personnel practices as paid staff. Um, and so just to bring this up a little bit, we do have backpacks that we are going to have ready in one of our um, outside containers. It's a storage container. Everybody's going to know the storage container lock combination. And then we're going to have backpacks in there. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the backpacks in a minute. But um, in there, we are going to put in some cutter, and you might have something that you prefer from home, that's fine. Um, and then some IVX as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this in a second, because it's, it's gonna come up again. Um, unfortunately, we're not gonna weigh you down with these containers, because they're way too big, but it's the same sort of effect as using those IVX uh, wipes. Um, and then if there's anything else that we can do to make sure, again, that uh, you need something out in the field, just let us know. Um, you're going to be here having your time used effectively. You're going to be receiving from myself and from John clear uh, and non-conflicting guidance and direction, being kept informed of activities pertaining to their assignments, not undertaking assignments that you don't want to do or you don't feel safe with, receive appropriate orientation, training, and supervision, like today. Um, and if there's anything else that we can do to clear up um, anything that uh, you feel like you need more information on, uh, more background information, that's what John and I are here for. Um, be made aware of the overall operation of the park, have opportunities for growth and provide input, and of course, being recognized for your contributions. Um, we're hoping to put something together at the end of the season to bring everyone back and let every, everyone know how much we do appreciate um, all of your hard work, all of your labors, and, and celebrate the season, the end of the season. Um, some of your responsibilities as volunteers make safety the highest priority, represent the National Park Service in a professional manner, um, and in doing that, Please make sure that you're wearing your hats and your shirts. We will get you name plates as well um, because if you're not labeled as a volunteer working at the park, you most likely the visitors are not going to pay any attention to you. They're going to walk right by you. But if you're wearing something like this to let them know that you're a representative of the park, they're definitely going to stop. They're going to listen 
and hopefully, you know, follow whatever kind of information or message that you're sharing with them. Um, follow park policies and guidelines and understand its organizational structure. We can send everyone the compendium because every park has its own rules and regulations. So if you could add that to, to your list. Uh, seek and accept the guidance and support needed to complete assignments, working as a team with paid staff and respect, and have respect mutual roles, providing notice of absence. So um, we are working through different kinds of um, applications for you guys to use to let us know when you're available to come into the park and volunteer. Um, we're going to be working on getting signup.com, but we still have to pay for the service and work through that whole paperwork process. But eventually, I'm hoping in another week, we'll have that cleared up and then we'll send that out to all of you guys. And hopefully that will be an easy way for you guys to let us know when you want to come in um, and when there's openings in your own schedule to have us out. And I think we're going to try to put those in hour increments. So if you have an hour to come into the park, um, you could just sign up on signup.com. And um, if there's any kind of issues that you need to leave the park, you could always call John. He's got a cell phone um, that you folks can reach out to him. And you also have his email. Um, and then hopefully making a good faith effort to resolve differences or problems. We're going to work through some conflict de-escalation scenarios in a little bit. Um, sometimes, um, unfortunately, not all of our visitors are happy with what we're sharing with them when it comes to rules and regulations. And so we want to give you an idea of some of the things that you might encounter out there on the beach and you're smiling, Jackie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but I'm sure all of those experiences are going to turn positive with some of the strategies and techniques that we're going to share with you. Um, and of course, caring for our park resources. You wouldn't be here if you didn't care about our park resources. And so the Shorebird Ambassador Program, it runs from May to August. It's a seasonal commitment. Um, you can work shifts, like I said, as little as one hour, two hours, whatever's going to work for you guys. We're not putting any kind of stress on, on you guys to say you have to, you have to do this or you have to do that. Just, um, just let us know by signing up through signup.com, signup.com. We're going to have the education booth set up at um, BC and Gunnison. We're going to be roving the beaches and engaging with visitors, answering questions hosting educational activities at the booths. Um, hopefully the volunteers are 18 years or older and they can volunteer if they're between 16 and 18, as long as parents sign off on that. And then June and July are our most important months, the most active months out on the beaches, and then the program winds down in August. And I'll just add too that this is something we, we are accepting like we're going to be recruiting throughout the summer as well if you guys know anybody that would also be interested in this feel free to like get them in contact with me they, we're making a recording of the training so they can just watch the recording as well mm -hmm. to get trained uh, so unfortunately there are some hazards out there in the summertime um, this last year we really didn't have many issues with mosquitoes but that's not to say that we're going to be experienced the same kind of summer this year. Um, again, we're going to have the cutter available, and if there's something stronger that you guys want to use, um, go right ahead and use that. We do have ticks. They're out right now. They usually start breaking out in March, and they like to go to the warmer areas of your body, which means your head, around your waist, and close to your feet. So when you're out, Volunteering in the park and you're done, make sure you do a check on yourself. Or if you um, want to ask a friend to check your head, you just never know. Because they don't jump, they do crawl off of plant species, but you can't feel them. And so we want to make sure um, that we're able to get those off of our bodies as soon as possible. It takes about 24 hours for them to start embedding under the skin, so you do have some time. <laughs> But make sure that you lead a tick check of yourself every time you're out there, especially, especially if you're near grasses, because they will, they congregate in tall grassy areas, and that would be the dunes. 
And so hopefully nobody's walking in the dunes because honestly that would be something else that we wouldn't want our visitors or you guys to be doing because they are sensitive and critical habitat here at Sandy Hook. And so if you're stepping on those dunes, you're actually doing damage to the plants that are growing there and all of the critters that are um, making their homes in the dunes. Then we also have poison ivy. Is everyone familiar with poison ivy? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leaves of three, leave them be. Um, it grows in various forms. It grows as a vine. It grows as a low-lying shrub. And sometimes it even grows as a tree. I know over in areas of Brooklyn um, that you'll see like literally trees of poison ivy growing. Um, and so you, you just want to make sure, um, again, you're not walking in tall grassy areas. That it does grow in the dunes. Um, it's growing all along Hartshorn Drive. Um, unfortunately, as I'm driving out, sometimes I see folks walking in and out of the, the poison ivy bushes. And so um, it's got that sort of shiny leaf. Um, and that's the oil, it's the urosol oil that's on top of the leaf, and it's, it's in, in the entire plant. So no matter what you touch, whether it's the leaf, the stem, the roots, depending on your body makeup, um, you're gonna break out into a rash. Uh, most likely you will. So just be careful out there. And then we have the sun. It is going to be hot out there. Make sure you stay hydrated. Um, and make sure that you have sunscreen as well. And if you get overheated, stop. Stop what you're doing, go to a cool area and just chill out, catch your breath. If you feel like you need help, call dispatch. Um, and if you feel like that's the end of your day, then that's the end of your day. You don't wanna push yourselves while you're out there in the heat. And pretty much said all this, except for the thing about tucking your pants into your socks, you know, classic thing if you expect to be, if you expect maybe you'll be walking off the muck to like grab a litter that might have been blown to the grassy area, might just be something you want to do to keep the ticks out. Um, our uniforms aren't the best for us to detect whether or not we have a tick on us. So um, you want to wear lighter clothing um, while you're out there so that you can see it on you. Again, pull your socks over your pants, wear a hat, Stay on the trails um, and wear bug spray, wear sunscreen, and um, just constantly checking yourselves out there. And check your partners too. You might be out there with a volunteer. Check in with, with, with one another. If you need help, again, call dispatch and emergency services will, will come out to you and help you out. Do you want me to go over this? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, sure. I think I said I would do that. So again, we want to make sure that you have the right uniform. So we have uniforms over here before you leave. We want to make sure that you have the shirt. Um, we do have t-shirts. If you'd rather wear the t-shirt, it is lighter than the polo shirt. Um, once we have everybody's names, we'll have the name tags created and we'll get those to you. And then we have the hats as well. It's really important for you guys to wear the hats because we have the volunteer patch on there. Um, we do have little goodies for you guys before you walk out today. We have a water bottle for you guys. So hopefully you'll take this out from the field with you or if you have a Yeti, that's even better than that water bottle um, because it keeps the water colder longer. But always make sure that you're hydrated while you're out there in the field. Um, and then at the end of the year, we'll have some more goodies to give out to you guys. So what's in the backpack? Um, these are all the items that are going to be in the backpack. It's your volunteer observation sheet on a clipboard. We're also going to put a rubber band on there because it, it does get very windy out there. We want to make sure that we're not losing these sheets. We're going to collect them. You're going to have a clicker to make sure that you're counting how many visitor contacts you have during the time that you're here because we take all that statistical information, we add it to our reports. And honestly, it's really important information because it has a lot to do with how much money we get for the volunteer program here in the park from year to year. So please make sure um, you're clicking as you're out there and you're providing us with those total stats every time you're out there in the field. I'll just tell you, because you know, we can actually put a slide for this. 
Uh, just real quick, yeah, so we didn't explicitly say this, but this is what will also be in the backpack that we're expecting you to fill out every time you're out there. It's a simple form, you're just gonna put down your name, the date, the shift time, like where you were, and then what we want you to record is the number of people you interacted with, and you can also mark down if any of them were interested in the program themselves. Mark down any bird species you might have seen, uh, some of the ones we are trying to track here, and any photos you might have taken. And there's room on the back for any additional notes. If, for instance, you had an incident that you might want to just have recorded, or just like a comment, something you think we could do better, you can write that down. And you will be returning this in the backpack to the lockbox at the end of the shift, and we'll be collecting them afterwards. You don't have to hand it off to me personally. Yeah, uh, some folks last year were scanning them and sending them over to you to an email, and that's perfectly fine. That, that works as well. Yeah. Um, and so there are some sheets in there as well to remind you about some of the facts um, that have to do with protection of the plovers, and you can share this with visitors to help educate them. Um, I said I'd go over everything that's in the backpack, so here's um, a set of binoculars. You're going to have your own water bottle in there. Um, if you're out there in the field and you don't know exactly what bird it is, there's um, a bird guide that's going to be in the backpack. And if you have your own guides, you can bring that. And then we have um, hand sanitizer, the rest the is the cutter, sensations, the rest is the, the front pocket. pocket. Yep, yep. And so this is a, a small first aid kit. Um, and these for only, you know, nicks and um, scrapes. If it's something a little bit more serious, remember, call dispatch. We have a camera in here as well. If you don't want to take pictures on your own cell phone, you can use this. Again, we'll collect the SD, SD card at the end of the uh, right. day. And, and just a note for anyone out there taking photos, uh, we have a lot of wildlife photos. Plenty of them from people like Dom who have really professional shots. We don't always have a ton of volunteers and visitor events, so if you're out there taking photos, that's really what we'd like to see, you know? Of course, always ask permission before you take somebody's photo, but that is sort of like more, if you see a deer, you know, that's very cool, but we don't necessarily need another photo of a deer. So That's a good point. You can save that one to your own photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, visitor interactions, the way that we interact with them, or them interacting with one another, um, we really do those, need those types of photos, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, and then the clicker, and then we'll have a pen and pencil in there as well. Right. And I'll just uh, real quick explain the two sort of main things uh, we're using, the two main apps. The first is Slack. We've got about 14 people on Slack, so are any volunteers here not on our Slack channel? If you can just raise your hand. Okay, so, oh, okay, so four of you. All right, before you go, um, if you just want to like maybe underline where you signed in, I'll send you guys specifically a link, so I'm not always blasting everybody with the same email. Uh, the Slack channel is where we'll be having uh, our important annou announcements and updates. Other Shorebird ambassadors have taken upon themselves to post uh, videos and pictures and little reports of their roves, which are just great information and really nice to see. You know, Dom in particular puts a ton of information up there. I'm really flattering you today, Dom, but <laughs> you do a lot of good work. Uh, and so yeah, it, and that way I don't have to send emails out every couple of days to everybody. So the Slack channel is something to get on. It is free, and that's what it looks like on the Slack channel. You can post in general feed. If we're ever doing events, we might make them separate channels to talk about, and of course you can directly message me. While we're waiting for sign up to get kind of figured out, if you do decide to go out on the beaches, I do ask that you just either post in the general or send me a direct message just so I can keep track of everybody's hours and make sure we know when everybody's out there. Sign up is something uh, we were experimenting on. I think some of you might have used it. I did hear some people weren't comfortable with the ads, which is why we're paying for the uh, better version. It's going to look something like this. It'll have shifts available at each of our locations. So once it's up and running, you will go to this screen, you will select a location, it's gonna be normally one beach to the other beach, and select a time that works for you, it'll be in one hour shifts. So you just click on a specific time and location. It'll have a little information there about where to get your backpack and what to do with it afterwards. 
Then you just uh, fill out your email so that it can send you a confirmation and just a name and phone number, again, for contact information. And once that's done, you will be locked in as that spot. So if you do lock yourself in and then later you can't do it or you have to leave early, again, a direct message to me will work fine through Slack. And that's really it. I just want to, um, again, emphasize that if you need anything, you can reach out to Jen, you can reach out to me. Uh, those are our email addresses. It's just going to be our first name, last name, with an underscore in between at nps.gov. Mine is parker.nps.gov. And uh, I do have a work phone number that I will also start including in my emails to you guys. And I'll put this information up on uh, Slack as well, so you'll have a readily accessible reference. Great. Um, so we're going to go right into, we have those law enforcement rangers here. Um, that being said, I've been here for over a decade now, seasonally and all that. So I'm super familiar with the park. Um, this is Chris Hurley. He's our EMT seasonal uh, for now, hopefully that changes soon. Um, he's going to be the point of contact for all your EMS questions, all your questions that way. A um, couple of really quick points that I just kind of wrote down this morning to talk about really quick. Um, it's been reiterated, safety is the number one concern. Uh, I'll hammer it again. Um, nothing happens in this park that is more important than your life. I don't care about a bird is injured, but you gotta cross the flowing river to get to it. It's not worth your life. Don't worry about it. That's literally what I get paid to do. So you can give us a call. Um, I believe Jen handed out the business cards with um, the dispatch phone number on it. If you didn't get one, it's on the table over there. Call that phone number for anything. It doesn't have to be an emergency. Question, comment, concern, call that number. It'll contact one of us. Um, there are 10 permanent staff, three supervisors, one chief ranger, and we're looking at detailing a, what's essentially a deputy chief for the park. So that person should be starting soon. Um, our seasonal staff, we're gonna have seven coming on, I believe it is. So we'll have almost 20 field rangers that you'll see us around. It, it, we'll be around, you can always flag us down. Um, a couple of points that the staff wanted me to talk about this year with everybody. Um, there's a couple of things that seem to come up every year with volunteers and folks who aren't doing this every day. Is um, if you see something, say something. You're not going to offend me if you call me for for anything. It's fine. Um, but with that, we do need everyone to be a good witness. So that means remembering where this incident is happening. You know, if there's a person involved, what they look like, what they said, where they went. Um, even just pull out your phone, everyone's got a phone, you can jot down little notes on it and just write, write that stuff down that helps us out to come and help you better faster. Uh, let's see, Jen talked about the de-escalation issues. Um, I don't know how long of a section that's gonna be, but um, the best advice I can give is, in today's climate, people really don't like law enforcement. And you're showing up with essentially badges and trying to assert your authority over somebody when they're in a nesting area or you know, doing something, you know, littering, whatever. Um, if someone gives you a hard time back, it's not your job to argue with them. It's your job to educate them, and if they choose not to receive the education, that's when you call us, and we come down and we can deal with it. Again, nothing is worth you getting into a fight over, nothing is worth your safety over, that's what we get paid to do. Um, the other thing with the dogs um, not being allowed on the Oceanside beaches, service dogs are good to go. We, we don't hammer them too hard. If I see somebody walking out onto any beach and they have a dog, it's, hey, sir, ma'am, whoever, you can't have the dogs on the Oceanside beaches. Oh, it's a service dog. Have a good day. That is that is the end of it. I'm not questioning them. I'm not, we can't legally. There's two questions we can ask them, and I don't, I don't ask them because it doesn't matter, because you can't, they can lie to you all day, and there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, I think Patty can talk more about it. She might know more questions, or more of the questions than I do. Um, so those are good to go. Um, last bit is, uh, Jen talked about the ticks. Um, it is April 30th. I have found eight ticks on me and I've done one walk in the woods, real walk in the woods. Um, they're here, they're in numbers, they're in droves. I live in the park, I walk my dogs every day. Just in the little side yard, I check my dogs coming into the park too, because they're bad this year. Um, I've gone out, I bought, it's called Permethrin. Um, don't think it's super great for people, but it's the best thing that I've ever used. Um, this cutter stuff works pretty good too. Um, on that end, uh, the poison ivy also is pretty bad. Some of us are lucky we don't get it. We're not affected by it, so don't be surprised if you see one of us running through the poison ivy to go get somebody. 
Um, but yeah, use that stuff, take care of yourselves. You're gonna know if you're allergic to it and how bad it gets, because it can be really bad here. Um, the last point I wanted to talk about is fire safety. So I'm the quasi-fire inspector for the park now. Um, so you'll see me around doing everything in all the buildings and all that. Um, part of that job is just kind of absorbing what is fire risk in the park. If you see somebody smoking a cigarette in a spot that's, you know, if it's dry out or in a high fire danger, that's another thing you can educate somebody on, right? If they're walking through the woods smoking a cigarette and we're at a high fire danger and it's windy and it hasn't rained in like a week and a half, talk to them about the fire safety, right? Don't, we don't want the parks to burn down. It's that time of year again. Um, but again, if somebody says, well, I'm going to do it over on one I can smoke here. Okay, just call the rangers. It's not illegal. It's just something to further talk about somebody so that we can do what we're all here to do, right? Preserve the resources. So on that, I'm going to hand it over to Chris Hurley. He's got anything for you. As John said, my name's Chris Hurley. Chris Hurley. Yeah, good again. Short <laughs> um, I work for the fire department in the U.S. Division. I'm the EMT here. I've been here about three years. Um, just as John said, this bat is your best friend. That phone number is being ingrained in your brain. It was ingrained in my brain. Now I lost it. Now you were ingrained in my brain. Keep it in your in your head. Keep it in your phone. Um, we're here to help you with whatever you need. We're uh, with the fire fire department, especially. We have the tools to help you. If you see a big piece of litter, we just found a 20 foot piece of lumber that got washed up ashore, and some volunteers managed to get it all the way up to the beach access. I don't know how. Kudos to you guys. <laughs> uh -huh. But if you guys can help with something like that, we're more than happy to come down and give you guys a hand. Uh, safety wise, as Jen said, if you see something, say something, and um, yeah, the first aid kit there, those are great for little nicks and scrapes. If anything bigger, even if you think it's a little nick, but it might turn to a big nick, call me. I'm more than happy to come down and be like, you're fine, go home, take a nap, you're good, or all right, let's get you to the hospital, let's get you taken care of. If you guys need anything at all, our phones are always on, dispatch is always on, we're here for you. Does anybody have any questions that um, they wanted to ask John? I just joined, I, I'd like to join today, but I wanted to know if there's a fee and how I sign up. Oh, all right, so we'll follow up with you right after, okay, right afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks yep. for coming. Um, yeah, if no one's got any questions, yeah, give us a call. Be safe this summer, drink your water, stay hydrated, do what you gotta do. Thank you for being here. It, I can't tell you how much of a burden you're lifting off of all of us just by walking around and talking to people. That's, it makes my life easier, so I appreciate that. Okay.